Okay. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, welcome to a February 23rd, 2021 uh, school board work session, work study session. And I would just like to remind you uh, as we begin for regular meetings, uh, you can send comments to comments at pageud.org no later than Monday by 5 p.m. before each regular meeting. Let me mention that again. It's comments at pageud.org no later than Monday by 5 p.m. Well, we're here for a work study session, board members and the guests. It's really good to see you. Uh, and let's go ahead and start off with a roll call. Uh, Chuck, will you start us off? Chuck Weiss, board Thank member. You. Desiree Hi. Feller, board clerk. Dee McCary, member. Sandra Kidman. And Bob Candelaria, uh, Superintendent Wallen. Identify yourself there, sir. Right here. Good to see everyone. Good to see you too. And we're joined by Lynn Hoffman, our board uh, executive secretary. Thank you. Let's go ahead and start off with our agenda. And uh, the for item A is a COVID-19 response and funding sources. Uh, Jeannie Wood and, and um, Superintendent Wallen. Afternoon, let me share my screen here. Can you see my screen okay, Bob? Perfect, thank you. Governing Board President Candelaria, Superintendent Wall and Governing Board members, good afternoon. Today, the purpose of the presentation is twofold. Number one, I want to provide a broad overview of our current reality at PUSD in terms of programming and funding when we consider the school improvement process, we really think about this as a cycle, plan, do, study, and act, or monitor. Right now, our sites are encompassed in all four of these actions in one way or another. Planning, our sites are currently completing their needs assessment and looking ahead to next year. Do, they're in the act of implementing their current integrated action plans study. They are examining the results of their current plan to see what changes need to be met for next year. And finally act, they're rewriting their plan or making changes in their current plan that can have an impact on student results in real time as well as looking ahead, as I said. The second part of the presentation will be to examine the timeline of our needs and how since March of 2020, our needs have been changed drastically and how they have evolved and, a change, and changed and our response to those at PUSD. Joining me today, I will have two of our directors uh, to help uh, facilitate this conversation, Tashina Williams, our Director of Student Support Services, as well as Art Marquez, our Director of Dining Services. Uh, Lastly, I want us to think through the lens of this year within PUSD, we came up with the theme, uh, PUSD Building Connections. And as we're talking through these needs, I want you to just think about um, the connections made and how we can facilitate and grow our work moving forward. This graphic on the screen now was one of the first graphics provided on the onset of COVID and as schools were really looking critically at how do we respond to the massive need that our students have, there was a list of approximately 10 needs that they narrowed down to three. And I still use this to focus my mind when I think about sustainability planning. I want us to pay attention to the middle bullet point in particular to improve the accessibility of differentiated instruction and support services during both in-person and virtual situations. That really is uh, the purpose of grant funding and how we need to think about how we use our money. This particular slide was shared at the National ESSA conference earlier this month, and this was provided by the CDC. And they themselves recognized that school needs, again, are different than they have been in the past. And they came up with five categories that they have identified as schools and districts reporting of where they needed to focus their efforts this year. Providing students access to technology, addressing food insecurity, 
developing opportunities for online learning, fostering social and emotional well being, and finally maintaining student equity. For the purpose of today's presentation, I really will be giving just a broad overview of all of these. And with the timeline moving forward, we'll need to come back for several other times to go through these in much more detail. But I'm thinking about this also in terms of timeline. So the first area that we're gonna talk through tonight is addressing food insecurity. When we think about the big numbers associated with this and when our schools first closed in March, this is the number of meals that were, that were served to our students. From August until now, this is the number of meals. And finally, this is a total of 214,202 meals served since March of last year. But that doesn't give you a lot of information about the process. And so ART is going to walk through what that has looked like at PUSD since March. So Art. Uh, thank you, Jeannie. Uh, thank you, board members. I uh, hope everybody can hear me. Tell me if you can't. Yes. Art. Um, so <clears throat> back in March, when we came back from uh, spring break, we weren't in school. That month on the 9th of March, the USDA actually uh, made allowances for school food authorities, us, to start our summer food service program early. They realized that uh, there's a lot of children or a lot of students in the country that sometimes school lunch is their only meal of the day and that we need to figure out how to get those meals for the kids that aren't going to school. So we started our SFSP program on March 23rd of 2020. And with help of volunteers uh, and with the help of the uh, chapter house heads, we were able to deliver meals to be delivered uh, from March to June. When we came back in August, we ran a month of the National School Lunch Program. The USDA was noticing that um, there weren't a lot of kids coming into schools and this is across the country. So what they did on September 2nd, they went ahead and reopened the summer food service program. Now the program that we are currently running is a community program. So not only can we feed the students that are enrolled in our school, we can also uh, feed the students uh, uh, ages zero to 18. Part of that being uh, we, we've got a lot of help uh, so far. The, we have uh, six bus routes and the drive through And what, recently we just opened our schools up to a uh, hybrid learning once again. And we've seen almost twice the number of meals being sold this time around, uh, sold, I'm sorry, uh, distributed this time around in the schools than um, back in October. It's really, it's, it's really nice that we're able to do this because even with those numbers and everything that you're seeing right there on the screen, we're still only doing about maybe on a good day, 40% of the meals we would usually be uh, giving out during a regular school year. Um, we currently are still running the uh, food, uh, the bus routes and transportation is just instrumental. I've done a tremendous job helping us with this. And even now, while they're doing the, the, the bus routes, picking up kids and dropping them off, they're still going out and um, providing meals to all those uh, students who are still remotely, uh, still learning remotely. Um, yeah, and we're, we're, we're able to do it with a reduced staff. And, you know, this helps us uh, control our costs. That way we can provide the maximum amount of quality that we can in an uncertain time. If there's any questions, please uh, let me know. I'm happy. Uh, I don't know how in depth that was, but um, I've got lots and lots and lots of information on this. I can go on for days. I have a question if I may. Yes, ma'am. So you said 40% um, of regular volume in, the, in like the, compared to the previous school year. That's um, I, I'm sure your company has done um, massive uh, analyzing 
And can you just tell us what maybe the top three or four reasons are why the numbers are down so much? Uh, one of the things are is our area is so spread out and that more than half our students are on the reservation. With the help that we have gotten from distributing uh, from transportation is uh, there were 18 routes with 205 stops. So we had to make a map with the most concentrated areas of service that we could give uh, our students. And that's one of the reasons. Um, another reason is when kids are uh, on virtual learning at home, one of the things is a lot of them do eat at home. And as much as we could try our best to get meals out, um, like, like early in the morning, one of the things is we have to work around our, our own scheduling and whatnot. Um, like I said, so far, the community has responded uh, very well. Uh, whenever there's a hiccup, we do find, a, we do hear about it and we do our best to fix it. I hope that answers your questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, are you still getting uh, from all our chapters and those kind of things? Uh, are there any, I know you had to work out an awful lot of logistics early on. And is that being consistent in terms of the help that we've got there? Or is it, you know, I Absolutely. see some of the, so yeah. in at the end of June, when we started winding down, a lot of the help we were getting from the chapter houses, um, and first of all, we were doing that because to uh, increase the amount of safety between the uh, uh, the reservation and, and the town, you know, this was a something we all came together as chapter house uh, as, uh, leaders of the chapters and uh, the school district. But as June wound down, everybody was there were some some of our volunteers were trying they were going back to work and they had other obligations. So what we did when we came back was uh, some of the, the waivers, some of the allowances we were able to do was uh, the buses. So we had the district staff to distribute and that's how we started doing it and that's how we're doing it again today. And as I recall, uh, and just from talking to Desiree an awful lot and also a lot of the issues there, it, they weren't, uh, singular issues they were at every chapter house but you found yourself some really strong go-to people at each one of the chapters to really help the distribution is that correct absolutely and some of those and distribution that, were were um teachers in the schools and other district right. members and like it was a it was a it was a big drive but a lot of people really came out and you know we showed her they showed their best and it's just a we we're here to feed the kids Right. And, to, and today things are pretty smooth. And as, as things pick up, are we going to also uh, add to those routes? Because I heard we, were, we had two more routes that we were going to take out. Uh, are we going to start running buses too? Um, if there is the uh, opportunity to do that, we absolutely will. Actually, after this last, um, this last week that we've been in hybrid, we've started seeing a, a pretty big shift that more of our meals are being distributed to uh, kids in, in school mm -hmm. and it's starting to shift uh, back. So the bus routes are delivering less and less, but that's good because that's meaning a lot of more kids are coming to, um, uh, to the schools, but we're still doing it for anybody who's out in uh, doing a uh, school virtually. And I'll just, I'll just say one last thing uh, because uh, this being such a huge issue and all the work that was going on to make sure that we could sustain and, and, and get it to as many people as possible. Uh, we were constantly hearing from the chapter houses and uh, you know, when you don't hear anything, that can be a really good sign. I haven't heard anything recently. And so I think that that's uh, potentially a good sign and, and good job to all you guys in the, in the chapter houses who are really making a difference. Absolutely. We try to be, or I try to be uh, working with Lionel to be on the chapter house uh, meetings as well. Because mm -hmm. like I said, we're still doing it and we're still offering and we want as many people to uh, participate as we can. Okay. Thank you, Art. Thank you.
Thank any you. Other? Any other questions for him? Sorry, did I interrupt you, Mr. No, no, Candelaria? You're no, you're good. Okay. I have a question. I know that now that you're serving weekend meals, has that helped improve numbers as well? And how often are parents utilizing the weekend meals? Uh, it's been real, the numbers, it's really helped out. And uh, we do, on the weekends, we are currently serving about uh, 800 uh, meals. So both uh, breakfast and lunches. So we're, uh, we do good. And people like we have our regulars. Hey, how you doing, sir? How you doing? They uh, around the same time and everything. And, you know, People so far have responded very well, especially to the weekend meals as well. Thank you, Art. I appreciate everything that transportation and the food department are doing for our families since Thank March. You. And I know it was a rocky start from the beginning, but I feel like we are moving along just fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Art. Uh, the next category is fostering social and emotional well-being. And again, because today, the topic of today really is big, big numbers um, with the broad overview of what this looked like, this is not an exhaustive list of what was on there. Um, as a matter of fact, when Tashina shared the list with me, she gave me a running list of things that the department, her department would have done um, regardless of the situation, things that her department has done in response to COVID and other, other items. So again, these are just the big numbers on here of what that looks like. In terms of the continuation of social and emotional learning, this will be a focus within our district moving forward in terms of building our MTSS system with this being at the forefront of that as a need continuing on and moving forward. But Tashina is going to share with you all what this looked like in particular in terms of meeting the needs for families on the onset. So Tashina. Good evening, board members. Um, I wanted to go over the list in front of you. These items were items that have been donated to our department from different um, sources since March. If you remember back when closure happened, there was minimal supplies available anywhere in the community. And we knew that for our families to be able to be safe and to be able to return to school, we would have to give them tools to mitigate um, COVID-19. I volunteered to drive a food van with school meals and I mainly drove to Kaibato and Inscription House route. And Art was kind enough to let me smuggle supplies in the vans. So through the course of delivering those meals, we took out um, the supplies you see in front of you, a lot of hand sanitizer, um, bleach cleaning supplies, um, cases of water for our families that don't, didn't have access to running water. And the chapters helped us hand those items out. Um, Art and I worked together and things changed through the summer, depending on stay at home orders, on the need of the school district for our department and delivering hot spots and devices. And so when we do a home visit, we will take masks and sanitizer and soap and try and speak with the students and the family in the home because we know at some time those students are going to be in our schools. And it's our way of letting them know that we're still thinking about them, even if they're at home, that we care about their well being, teaching those mitigation strategies, and trying to keep them healthy. Um, which is important for their social emotional development and to know that we care. So we've been very lucky that we had donors that were willing to donate all of these items. And I think everyone at times, I know I've said I need water and everyone's been really great about donating it. And um, like I said, if we have a reason to go to a home, we try to bring these things along um, with our food bags as well. So. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Tashina. 
Thank you, Tashina. The next category is developing opportunities for online learning. Again, this is not a full list, but I wanna go over what this looked like. And this work began in May and in June. Sage and Sand Virtual Academy, the application to apply for the school was done early in the summer because at that time we had not yet received the flexibility for schools to offer online or distance learning to students. Since then, Sage and Sand Virtual Academy has received a site visit and full certification to remain within our district for next school year. Our distance learning plan, the work for that, although a requirement of the state, began also in the month of June. And at the fruition, this is what we called our continuous learning plan. Superintendent Wallen brought in teachers and other staff members to start developing what the reopening of schools would look like for the next year. And that work did morph into the required distance learning plan. With every revision of how we're returning to schools, we submit an updated distance learning plan. And this is a compliance document uh, for ADE. Our on-site support services, we had an open OSS for the entire first semester of school beginning in August. This was a place um, where students, although we were in virtual only for a period of time and then prior to moving to hybrid, this was an opportunity or a safe place for students to go who lacked internet, proper internet connections or needed a place to go. We did take out a waiver for our on-site support services for the month of January, but these services resumed again on February 1. And the last bullet that I have on this is examination of alternate testing sites. Another requirement that the state currently has not changed is the idea that state testing still will take place for our students. And we await further guidance of what does that look like. Right now, one flexibility that has been extended to us is us taking the test to our students um, in conjunction with students coming and testing within our school site. We have taken some steps to prepare ourselves for that. Lionel So and Abraham Rodriguez, our district assessment coordinator, have gone out to chapter houses to see what the connectivity would look like. Um, and we're starting to really look at that more closely to see if that is a real possibility um, moving forward and if it's a necessity for our students based on continued waiting period of, of what those requirements will be from the state. Any questions on this category before I move on? Again, these are just the big, big items for this. Just remind us a total total number of, of folks, you know, participating online, and, and how has that changed since the opening of the, you know, opening of the school on the sixteenth. You know, Bob, I couldn't give you the exact numbers. I know building principals reported those out at our status meeting on Friday. Um, and I apologize that I can't give you specific numbers of that. We are up from when we had hybrid in the fall, I know that. And for, I'm thinking of Desert View in particular, um, they had an increase each day um, of the onset of that. So I can share those numbers out with you later so you can get the exact, I don't wanna get it wrong. No, oh, that, that's good. That, yeah, appreciate it. I, I, I just noticed a whole bunch of kids on the playground and all that kind of stuff and a lot of activity, uh, especially at the K through five areas. Our principals were very excited about the number of students that were able to return. Yeah. Last week we were averaging about 400 a day um, and we were bringing in about a hundred on the buses. Uh, this week that's increasing. Um, I don't have that number yet, but I know this morning when I was at Lakeview, there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of kids coming in. There were kids who had fallen off our radar screen in terms of attendance who are now showing back up and, participating in class, so we're very excited about that. Uh, one side question to this, Larry, appreciate that. Uh, I know that we've had a, an awful lot of issues, or some issues anyway, with uh, with failing Chromebooks or failing hotspots or those kind of things. Uh, 
we still stand okay with hotspots and and the, you know the technical uh, iPads and all those things. That's going to come up in the next piece of the presentation. Oh, I'm very sorry. good okay. question, and uh, Brian can answer that more definitely than I can. Okay. Thank okay, you. Jeannie. That was a great anticipatory set. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next category is providing students access to technology. Uh, these are the numbers right now of devices that have been handed to our students, 1,854 Chromebooks for students in grades three through 12th grade, 690 hotspots of 700 that have been purchased, again, based on need, and 527 iPads for students in grades K through two. This, once again, is not an exhaustive list Students were also given access to headsets, flash drives, uh, mice or a mouse so that they could operate their Chromebook a little easier. Uh, so there were other items in addition to this. These were just the big items when we think about access to technology. And these items were purchased from varied funding sources as well, going back to the flexibilities given within Title I because we had unused program funds from after school and summer school programs that were able to buy a small amount of this and then ESSER one monies helped to supplement this as well. Okay. When we think about student technology, it wouldn't be fair not to think about teacher technologies that were provided. Each of our teachers were given a laptop, a headset, an Apple iPad and a bag two monitors, a web camera with a mic, and an Apple TV unit. These purchases, again, from multiple funding sources, uh, from ESSER money in particular, and ESSER two will fund some of this as well, but we had a need for our teachers to connect to our students differently. At times, our teachers were in their classroom and they had students that were connecting virtually and they had students sitting in front of them as well. So that really did change the dynamic of what their workstations by necessity looked like. And so this was the response to them for those items. Um, I know Brian coincidentally is on the call for here. I had not intended on him speaking to the number of that in particular, but that doesn't mean that he can't jump in and answer any questions that I did not. I thought that this could be the second part in coming back. I know that with all of the technologies given, one of our next steps in considering how we need to move forward is all of these technologies have been given out to our students and now really being mindful of how are these technologies going to be returned to our buildings and to our district. That is a work in progress right now. The second part of that is at the onset of COVID, there wasn't a lot of insurance policies that one could go out and purchase for these technologies. Like so many other things with COVID, when there's a need, there's a response. So there's companies almost coming out of the woodworks um, with ways to help us to spend some of this money. And so a discussion that is ensuing right now is insurance discussions and what that needs to look like. And finally, this does have a place in how we're planning for summer school. Right now, summer school discussions are, are ongoing. We're looking at the necessity of an intensive summer school and what that would look like. Um, we are hoping that students are able to access our campus and come for that, but there still may be the necessity for some of that to be virtual or students participating that way as well. That most certainly will impact technologies and um, students keeping them versus them handing them in at the end of the year with those programs moving forward. Bob, did you get your big question answered about the number of hotspots? 690 is our current out right, with right, 700 right. possible. So we have 10 on hold right now. Okay. Yeah, I did. But I, you know, I'm really aware of how there's an awful lot that we've had to work on and, and the insurance thing. I think we've had a conversation, Larry and I have, but the, the, and this is for later date probably, but we've been in a deep dive of new learning for everybody from the teachers through 
And uh, the question I'd, at some point in time, not necessarily this evening, uh, how do you see that affecting the way we the way we conduct education next year when we're all back in live? Uh, because I, I have an idea that education m modes and methods have changed and we can utilize that. Absolutely. And it even changes the dynamic of... Um, you know, the joke was there will be no more snow days. There won't be a necessity <laughs> for that. And right. students being able to connect with their coursework in a different way than they ever have mm -hmm. before. And we don't want to ruin that momentum because it's a good one that we're on. It didn't feel mm -hmm. good <laughs> when we had to react as quickly as we did. Um, but education is forever changed and we know that. Yeah, thank you. Do you make a comment, Bob? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so regarding technology, one thing that I would really like to see us keep doing is that all assignments stay, you know, on online, basically. I cannot tell you how nice it is to be able to check if my kids did their assignments, they turned them in on time, what's missing, and then also the communication with the schools is, uh, from the point of a parent for me has um, tremendously improved because it's no longer that I find, you know, stashed away papers for <laughs> events that happened three days ago. Now I get a, you know, a little ding on my phone and it says Lakeview has updated their story or please check this, you know, and I like that they actually use different apps because immediately I know this is Lakeview talking to me. This is Desert View talking to me. So I really appreciate those efforts, and I hope that we keep some of that. There are some things that I'm not so excited about, but those things, the things that I mentioned just now, they have been very helpful, and I feel like communication is much easier that way, at least for me. I know some people might struggle with um, accessibility. But I think I also know there's a lot of people have smartphones, and with a little bit of help, we can learn how to use that technology. And it's really, I, I mm -hmm. think it's really quite fabulous what has been done. Yeah, great point. Okay. The last category, and again, I will not go into a lot of detail on this, but maintaining student equity. And this is one of the most recent graphics that have been shown to illustrate this point. If you look at the three children or people on the left, you notice that each of them has been given access to a box that is the same size. Uh, that is the definition of equal. When you look at the three children or students in the middle box, you notice that they have been given different size boxes to meet their needs. And this is the definition of equality giving students what they need to be successful or to have opportunity. But the last graphic is a column that has been added in the months since the onset of COVID. Um, some call this justice, but it really is the idea of barrier removal, knocking down that fence. And then when we do that, everyone has equal access and opportunity to what they need. And when we think about equity, that really will be the new buzzword in education, equity. And we often see that followed by the words inclusion, equity and inclusion, what does that look like? And at a recent Project Elevate convening, one of the quotes that was used was um, equity and inclusion. Diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. And so when we think about what structures we're putting in play for our students, we need to be mindful of the removal of unnecessary barriers to give them access to opportunities moving forward. There are some core competencies of equity, focus, feedback, instruction, leadership, and efficacy. Our attention will go to those as we begin our sustainability planning moving forward because just as Mrs. Kidman pointed out in the earlier section, there's some 
good unintended consequences that happened as a result of COVID-19. <laughs> so we need to take advantage of that and move forward in thinking about these and how we can provide equitable access for our students and our families. How does this connect to my work? <laughs> so when we think about the improvement process and where we are right now, our schools are actively engaged in this pro process in terms of their entitlement funds. They are working to complete their comprehensive needs assessment. They are conducting root cause analysis and they are starting to develop and write their integrated action plans. However, they are implementing last year's integrated action plans. They're monitoring what has worked versus what hasn't worked. What do we need to get rid of? What do we need to retain? And when we think about evaluation, that comes at the end typically. Those are things uh, when we think about compliance of state assessment results, A through F letter grades, teacher evaluation results. Those are the big things that we do at the end. To show you this in a little different way, I want to pull out the consolidated grant. This is our four for one grant. Four grants combined in one is our consolidated grant. The four grants that live within the consolidated grant, Title I, Title II, Title IV, and Title V. And I had mentioned earlier that the grant, the grant is just a bridge between programmatic and fiscal responsibilities. What are our needs tell us to do programmatically? What do we need to do? What do we need to have to offer correct support services to our students? And how do we monitor to ensure that we are being appropriate fiscal stewards of this money? So when we think about Title I, and I've described the process of improvement of what our schools are going through now, when we think about monitoring that work, we do that through our 90-day plans and our benchmark results and the evaluation of that state assessment results. For Title II, there has been a different need for training this year for our teachers. Some of what the money has been spent on is listed here, but there's other items. And another good unattended consequence that came from COVID is so many of the trainings that we used to travel to and go to have been made free to us or come to us. Um, also on this list is some of our BT trainings. Uh, the planning for that was on there as well. And Title IV is a new grant within our district. It's not a new funding source, but in the past we have chosen to transfer Title IV monies into Title I. This year we will write a Title IV grant. There are linker grants connected to this as well that I did not go into detail with. There is some 22 grants that are connected to the consolidated grant that help to supplement the purpose of the grant sources. Within Title IV, Title IV-B is 21st Century Learning Grant that pays for after school and summer school programming. Four of our school sites will apply. Manson Mesa High School is not eligible to apply for this funding source because of its size. But that takes us to Title V. Right now, Title V funding or RLIS funding pays for our summer school. We are waiting to hear about the possibility of additional SURSA money, CARES money, CARES Part Two money that might become available to help fund that. If so, we're gonna be able to rewrite Title V this year to reuse that money and eventually going out for 21st century funding would also relieve Title V funding because we would have an alternate funding source for that. I just wanted again to show you the big picture of this. And this doesn't include our Title III, Title VI grants, um, some of our other funding sources and competitive grants that are coming in. The reason I'm sharing this with you now is these preliminary allocations will hit next Monday, March 1st. And these grants, are due by May 1. And so this is the part of the timeline that we're in right now in monitoring and examining what we need, but also as these additional funding sources are becoming available, 
really deciding the appropriateness of where each of these program needs should be and where we put our money. This graphic is old, <laughs> it's dated, uh, but I share it with you because I like the header on top where it describes the three stages of recovery, relief, prevention and preparation and recovery efforts. On the onset of COVID, the dates listed were relief phase was from March until May. The preparation and prevention phase was June 1st to August 30th. And the recovery phase was listed from September 1 of 2020 to September 30th of 2021. However, we know that for months, and it wasn't because we were behind, it really was the circumstance, we continued to be in the preparation and prevention stage. That's still where we live in a lot of ways now because we are starting uh, to think about what does our summer school programming need to look like? What does that look like that we're back in hybrid learning models? So each of these circumstances has presented itself in a different way. These were the first three um, funding sources of money, but I want to go to the next part because I think this breaks it down a little nicer. So when we think about ESG monies, this is the amount of money, just over $1 million that we received from that in the fall. Our ESSER monies um, come from the CARES Act, Corona Aid Relief and Economic Security Act funds. Whenever there's an act of Congress, there's the funding source that goes with that. And we received just under half a million dollars for that. ESSER two monies and the big unveiling of that, we're aware of what our allocation is, just over $2 million. But the first funding webinars and that are tomorrow, so we will have more information there. The acronym associated with it is one without a vowel, so there's a lot of controversy about how you say this, SIRSA or CURSA. Uh, but this is round two really for that response and relief part because we are in the preparation and prevention part of this. Total money right now within our district, $3.6 million for these funding sources. We're paying very close attention to these monies because it does blend back to how we're spending our entitlement money and what additional competitive grants we will go out for based on how we are spending these monies. Okay. So at the beginning of the presentation, I had said that I had two main purposes to provide you a broad overview of the needs and to provide a timeline of what this looks like. Again, I know this will need to be a continuing conversation in a couple of different parts. Um, as I said, the, the webinar for the ESSER two monies is tomorrow. The allocations will drop for us next Monday. And at that time, we will have more information to help decide and to build our sustainability plan moving forward. What questions do you have right now? <laughs> Anybody, board members? Uh, I'll just, I have one and it just has to do with, you know, 3.6, that's really awesome. And great job, holy cow. Uh, with these grants comes obviously metrics uh, and accountability and those kind of things. And I know that we have heard some of that, uh, but, but at some point, like just a kind of a real nice budget breakdown and this is where this is going. This Cause we, we do talk about it. And I think we talk about it. You guys talk about it in detail and we, we hear it kind of in piecemeal. So at some point, I like to see just a breakdown of that, uh, where where each one of these things are going that are really helping us do what we need to do. Um, and, absolutely, I think that's an important part of the conversation, and I didn't do a really good job of stating this, um, but even here, the description of this for some right. of these programmatic areas where we have always had a plan of how to spend this money. <laughs> right. Right. Um, the needs have changed our plan. <laughs> and so um, it's interesting that we are still bound to this timeline of, hey, May 1, um, 
But I know that in my world, it's not only um, helping to write some of these grants. A lot of that work is on different people other than me for that. But we know that there will be multiple revisions to some of these grants. And we have to be okay with that. But yes, that is a powerful part of the story is putting that all together to really show where where we have spent according to what fund. Right, exactly. And like I said, I I know just about that much of, about grants being around you just a little bit, but uh, I do know about the metric stuff that comes with grants and, and especially when you start you know, on a windy road. And I know that puts a, a big importance on our finance group and those kind of things and you uh, and ultimately Superintendent Wallen. So and the board. So I'd really like to see that uh, in a little more detail, maybe at a work study session somewhere down in the future. Yeah, I, um, Shannon Garrison and I today attended the state ESSA today and tomorrow. And one of the sessions that I went to um, was get on the Corona bus. And it's so interesting because that was a lot of the topic of conversation is how do we report time and effort differently now Yep. Um, what do some of these things need to look like in terms of compliance? And a lot of it is interpretation. A lot of it is going back to the guidance documents, looking at what that needs. Um, and it's different because these funds in particular are, they're supplant funds. They're not supplemental funding sources. So there's a right. lot of flexibility right. and allowance with that, which is a good thing. Um, that there are going to be some conditions that we need to ensure that we have the proper internal controls in place uh, for these monies. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, Jeannie, excellent. Appreciate, uh, appreciate what you guys are doing. And it's literally, when you start talking about these things, really a whole staff that, that, is, involved, that is involved with this. Uh, so yeah, it's really, really nice that we have this to lean on for a year or so. <laughs> so thank you. Anybody else? And, and that's a good statement, Bob, because just think of this as a bubble. It's not here forever. It's, it's going to be here until uh, about a year is about right. And then we'll be back to the regular calculations and formulas that drive budgeting and stuff. But this is going to be so helpful in getting through this this um, crisis that we're facing and moving forward. And Jeannie has done a tremendous work and everyone that's helping her out is tremendous. Our teachers are tremendous uh, and making it work so, so well for us. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and move on to item B if that's all right with everybody. Uh, and that uh, item B uh, is AVID presentation and it's Shannon Garrison. Good evening. Bob, are you able to see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Good evening, President Candelaria, Superintendent Wallen, members of the board, colleagues, and our great community of PAGE. Thank you for the opportunity this evening to present on AVID. AVID stands for Advancement Via Individual Determination. AVID is a part of our curriculum and instructional framework, one of our big rocks as a district, and as a focus of our district and school integrated action plans. The goal of this evening's presentation is to continue to build our governing board's understanding and background in AVID, provide an update on where we've been with AVID, where we are currently and where we are growing. We will also hear from our building principals about AVID and see AVID in action and celebrate what's been happening within our schools. Thank you to our building leaders for joining me this evening. My name is Shannon Garrison and I am the Director of Curriculum and Instruction for our district and also the AVID District Director. As we think about our vision, the direction that we're headed as a district, AVID is directly aligned to meeting the unique learning needs of all students in order to become college and career ready and successful in a global society. Our day-to-day purpose or our mission statement reflects our commitment to a learning for all 
and that we are responsible and accountable for every, for the education of every learner in our district. Let's hear about the AVID effect. I became a teacher because I wanted to provide students with everything that I wanted from my teachers. I, I firmly believe there is no more important, no more noble profession than education. Teaching is more of a calling than it is a career. There's not enough words to, to measure the impact that we have on students and their families. It's not about us. It's we create the opportunities, we find the opportunities, and that student walks through the door. It goes beyond just teaching them your subject. It really does. Even the smallest things that we say and do can have an enormous impact on someone's life. We have the ability to help kids succeed, to surpass the things that they think they can do. I went to Abbott Summer Institute and I saw the passion that these teachers had. I saw the effect that a teacher can have on a student beyond the classroom, in the community. My life changed when I met Abbott. I had no idea what I was getting into. And before the year was over, I got it. It made sense that this entire campus that I was teaching at was about to change. The first year coming at Avid is completely overwhelming. And if you're not a little afraid and nervous, <laughs> Then, uh, then you probably haven't been paying attention. <laughs> There's the vibe. You can feel the vibe on the campus. I like the fact that all of our schools are valued and their culture is valued. Avid allowed me to see the instruments in my room, and I felt like I was always a great conductor. And so now, all the horns are playing, the cellos are drumming, the guitars are playing, the piano is tinkling, and everybody's enjoying the sound of the orchestra. The biggest thing is for it's more of a college going focus. It's big in big picture now. If you're on that stage giving your best and, and using all your teacher skills, then you know you got it. Avid is open for teachers because it gives teachers the tools to connect with and help students succeed. Avid has truly made you become a more effective teacher. You're changing somebody's life. You're, in some cases, creating somebody's life. You have the chance to make a young person the person that they don't even know they are. What are you going to do to keep your kids engaged? What can we do together? Where can we go together? What can we, again, build together? Don't give up. And if you don't give up, then your kids will see it and they won't give up. So as we think about AVID, AVID really is structured around four domains, instruction, systems, leadership, and culture. You can see that at the center of everything is student agency and our students. AVID is focused and insists on rigor, breaking down barriers, aligning the work, and advocating for all learners to be college and career ready. So let's talk about where we've been as a district with AVID. As we think about our district strategic plan, I'm going to go ahead and open this up for our team. 
And we've talked about the four domains with AVID, which really are leadership, culture, systems, and instruction. And you can see that our strategic plan as a district is centered around those four domains as well. In 2019-2020, we had some new things happen within our district. One of them was um, I joined our school district again and I'm back as the director of curriculum and instruction and also had the honor of taking on this opportunity with leading the AVID work as the district director. Desert View and Lakeview joined AVID and started their AVID journey last school year as well and started with implementation year one. As we think about the start of this school year, we had new principals. We welcome Nancy Warner to Lakeview Primary and also Mary Stahl to Desert View Intermediate School. During the 1920 school year, we reviewed options with Manson Mesa to become an AVID school. You'll notice that they are the only K through 12 school that is not currently a part of AVID. We at that time did not proceed. Um, I'm going to review this information with Dr. Hubble and look to plan for next school year. Just last year was not the right time for that work and we'll revisit that again and evaluate to see if we're ready to move forward in the AVID journey. Going back even further and thinking about the timeline of when all of our schools joined in on their AVID journey, Page High School was the first to become an AVID school and started in 2006. Page Middle School joined in their AVID journey in 2013, and Desert View and Lakeview Primary started their AVID journey last school year in 2019. Are there any questions about where we have been as a district in reviewing this information? All right, so let's talk about where we are currently as a school district. The focus has been on growing a district-wide AVID system so that we're able to support AVID kindergarten through 12th grade within our district. Together, we'll continue in this work to grow AVID. We provide monthly updates within our curriculum instruction and assessment newsletters to update all of our staff on AVID. One of the great resources and tools that comes with our AVID program is myavid.org. And all of our teaching staff across the district has access to this awesome resource and the tools that are a part of this resource. So even though Manson Mesa has not started their journey with an AVID formally um, to become an AVID school, they do have access to all these tools and resources and are using them. And it, when you walk into the Mesa, Manson Mesa campus, you do see evidence of culture uh, around college and career. And also you see implementation of AVID instructional strategies used. The last two years we've focused on increasing our professional development opportunities for all of our staff. We want to make sure that all of our staff has the opportunity to learn more about this system and also effective instructional strategies from AVID. The goal is to continue to provide additional opportunities around AVID. Teachers who participate and learn in eight modules become AVID trained and AVID training is a part of our coaching and certification instrument, the CCI, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit. And we wanna to continue to encourage all of our colleagues and staff to take advantage of the increased professional learning around AVID in our district. We have a new program manager specialist as of this school year. His name is Andy Waite. And due to COVID, um, we won't have any formal coaching observation visits on site this year. Usually the program manager specialist works with each of our schools and the district director to coordinate a coaching observation visit each school year. But unfortunately, during due to the current circumstances, we're not able to support that. As we think about AVID meetings, we host a quarterly district meeting where the building principals and AVID site coordinators come together with myself as the district director to focus on the um, big picture district needs around AVID and our work. 
School site teams meet regularly. Most meet weekly, if not weekly, they meet two times a month. Also where we are currently is using our CCI, the coaching and certification instrument to guide decisions around AVID. Um, we want to continue to use it to support ongoing and improve ongoing and continuous improvement. And this really is our guiding document for our work and monitoring the effectiveness of the implementation. We will continue to use the CCI to also celebrate growth and progress. So as we think about where our schools are currently with our certification, at the end of this last school year, um, and when you think about the CCI, you really are reflecting on the year prior. Schools complete the CCI throughout the school year, and those are due to me at the end of the school year. We use that information to review whether or not we've met our goals for AVID and use it to plan forward for the following school year. At the end of the 2019-2020 school year, Page High School is a school-wide AVID certified school. Page Middle School, is an affiliate school. What this means is they've focused on the AVID elective. And at one point, we're a school-wide AVID school with that certification. Um, and we are working towards getting Page Middle School back to be an AVID school-wide certified school. Desert View and Lakeview are new to AVID, and they are both in implementation year two. After this year, we will look at the certification ratings for each of those schools. They still participate and complete the CCI, but that really is a, a baseline and we look at the growth and progress. And next year we would be looking at the certification status. Are there any questions about certification? I have a question, Bob, if I may. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so you said uh, um, the middle school was AVID certified before, but it isn't anymore. Can you give us um, the reasons why? Sure, so the coaching and certification instrument really is that, that measurement. They've focused on the AVID elective um, and are growing towards becoming school-wide again. They've made improvements and growth towards getting back to that certification status, um, but are currently just an affiliate. Uh, as we review this information here in the next couple of months, uh, the goal is to move them back to that certification status. And if we do not reach that, continuing to grow that into next year. Okay, but what happened that we lost it in the first place? So I, I can't speak to why we lost it in the first place because I was not with the district at, at that time. Okay. Uh, what okay. that would have happened though, Sandra, is that um, we didn't meet all the CCI indicators specifically for that certification status. Okay, so what you're saying is I need to talk to the people that were there at that time. Yes, and we can also okay. pull that information and could look at that individually too or provide some additional information on um, that historical perspective as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So where are we growing as a district? Together in this work, we'll continue to grow AVID across the district. We know that we have opportunities now for kindergarten through 12th grade. We want to grow in our CCI and increase ratings on our indicators in all four domains. So even if we have a a certified school status, we want to continue to grow in those indicators and get better with our work around AVID and how we serve our students. And ultimately the goal with our work is to increase academic achievement. All of our kindergarten through 12th grade learners have access to AVID and get to see that culture in their school as well as the strategies um, being implemented by their teachers and ultimately they will be prepared with tools and strategies to help them in their post-secondary experience, whether that is college or their career or life in general. When we think about the CCI and the success of using those results, ultimately we will have improved academic performance. We will close the opportunity, expectation and achievement gaps. We'll prepare our learners for post-graduation experiences and increase in college, career, and life. 
There is information here and a link to the coaching and certification information that you can access to learn more about the CCI. And I'd be happy to provide any additional information to the board to help support in that learning. So as we think about AVID in action and celebrating our schools, I am joined this evening by our building principals. And our first principal this evening is Nancy Warner at Lakeview Primary. She is going to celebrate implementation year one and now in year two for AVID, as well as provide information on the domain of culture. Nancy. Thank you, Shannon. Good evening, Governing Board members and Superintendent Wallen. Ms. Garrison shared with you that AVID Schoolwide is structured around the four domains of instruction, system, leadership, and culture. In sharing with you what AVID in action looks like at Lakeview Primary, I'm going to focus, as she mentioned, on AVID Schoolwide culture. This domain focuses on a common belief in student success, high expectations for all, as well as community activities and college awareness. Teachers in kindergarten through second grade engage students in lessons on growth mindset and the power of yet to help students grasp the concepts of grit and perseverance. Student goal setting allows the teachers to work alongside students to help them understand what it means to set and meet high expectations and to develop self-efficacy. College awareness at the primary level starts with a physical envir environment that promotes a path towards college or a technical career. Teachers prepare displays of various colleges or technical schools outside and sometimes inside of their classrooms. Students are encouraged to share their hopes and dreams for their futures and to learn more about what it takes to reach these goals. Mrs. Castellan, our school counselor, is currently working with a group of second grade students to plan a virtual career day. This career day event is an example of how AVID helps to bring our families and local communities together. I'd like to take a minute to give a shout out to our current AVID site team members. Um, many of them have been with us since implementation in 2019, and we added four new members this school year. Robin Wingrove, is a first grade teacher at Lakeview and is also our AVID site coordinator. Holly Castellan is our school counselor. Hattie Williams is a first grade teacher at Lakeview. Julia Redman, another first grade teacher. Celine Henderson is our second grade teacher. Leandra Sessions is on our team and currently serves as the district gifted teacher. Lisa Horsley is our student achievement teacher. Mary Kate McLeaf, a kindergarten teacher here at Lakeview and Brittany Skinner, is a second grade teacher. They are a team of dedicated educators and we are fortunate to have them helping us drive AVID forward here at Lakeview. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Any questions from our governing board around culture or AVID implementation at Lakeview? Yes, this is Charles Weiss. I had a question. Yeah, go ahead, Charles. Um, for you and probably the principal at, uh, is it Desert View? Did you say or Lakeview? Lakeview. Um, I was just curious, you know, uh, trying to understand the AVID program, I want to know how this is going to help uh, teachers and students there and what impact, if, if it's gonna be a positive impact for students as far as, um, uh, learning or becoming more successful and maintaining those grade levels and promoting up to the next grades? Is this going to be a, a tool that you'll be using to help these students better to be more successful? Or what's the goal for that again? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it has been wonderful to welcome on board our two elementary buildings as it provides an opportunity for the learners in our district to start with AVID strategies in kindergarten. As we looked back through some of these pictures here, this was what Lakeview Primary, the entrance looked like last school year. Now keep in mind with COVID that things have looked differently and we have um, have had our learners here for 
remote learning. We came back for hybrid in October. We went back to remote learning and now are back in a hybrid learning situation where we have some learners in person and some learners also still in remote. And so things have looked differently. So you're getting to see some Abbott in Action photos from what the culture looked like within our buildings last year. So those learners have access to those strategies, including learning organizational skills, the implementation of planners and AVID binders in our elementary buildings. One of the things that you see in the pictures here is the student evidence. This was evidence that was displayed of our, what our students had been learning about at Lakeview. And then the picture on the left is a family engagement night that our staff hosted at Lakeview around or to give information to our families about, about AVID and asking our learners as young as our kindergartners and first graders and second graders to think about what they want to be when they, they grow up. And so that AVID culture really presents an opportunity for learners to start thinking about the bigger picture as young as kindergarten and helping prepare them with strategies and tools that they can use throughout their educational experience as they transition from second grade over to third grade at Desert View. And then when they transition to from Desert View to Page Middle School and then to Page High School or Manson Mesa and even beyond that, really the goal with, with this work and the, the strategies and tools should be there to help learners for post-secondary education as well as a post-secondary career and life in, in general. And so, yes, all of the strategies and tools should be supporting our learners as they move through all of our schools and beyond the K-12 experience. Thank so you. So Nancy, can you add to that? Sure. How, how does AVID help students get organized, for example? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you'll, you will hear one of the other principals later on in the presentation focus more on the domain of instruction. Um, I didn't speak to that too much, but um, Shannon mentioned Wicker, writing, inquiry, collaboration, organization, and reading. Um, and we focus on those, those areas within the classrooms and instruction. So um, providing professional development to teachers around instructional strategies uh, that do focus on high rigor and high expectations for learning in the classroom from day one. Um, as she mentioned before, we've had AVID in middle school and high school for, for several years now. And so it's, it's exciting to have it down at the K-5 level. Um, AVID in elementary is not an elective. It, it, it starts off and continues as a school-wide implementation. Um, so the opportunity for all students to be provided with these opportunities is great. Thank you, Nancy. Um, now we're going to move over to Desert View Intermediate with Mary Stahl, our building principal, to celebrate AVID in action as well as talk about leadership. Good evening, governing board members. Good evening, Superintendent Wallen. So my role, my task today is to talk to you about the leadership domain. Um, in the CCI, the leadership domain states that AVID school-wide leadership sets the vision and tone that promote college and career readiness and high expectations for all students in the school. To, to meet the elements in this domain, the school needs to show that the school's college and career readiness mission and vision is aligned with AVID's philosophy for college and career readiness and is reflected in site decisions, documents, and policies and supported by all stakeholders. So Desert View started this um, we, be, we created our first draft of our mission and vision, and they are currently in alignment with the principles um, outlined in the comprehensive needs assessment. And our next step is to connect it to AVID's mission, which is to close the achievement gap by preparing all students for college readiness and success in a global society. So I'm gonna share with you the, um, the first draft of the mission and vision statement for Desert View. 
Our mission states that we are committed to providing a safe, well-rounded experience that motivates, challenges, and supports all students academically, socially, and emotionally. And our vision is Desert View Bobcats are self-motivated, lifelong learners who strive to be responsible and productive global citizens through creative problem solving and by advocating for themselves and others. I'd like to take a moment to shout out to my AVID team as well. Um, Wendy Gilbert is a fourth grade teacher and she's our AVID site coordinator. Lauren Veers is our third grade teacher. Fran Tucker is our fifth grade teacher. Samantha Wright is our student achievement teacher. Jennifer Latham is our reading interventionist and Carolyn James is another fourth grade teacher. And they've been working diligently this year to um, present to our staff those effective wicker strategies um, and they do this monthly. So we are looking forward to moving forward with AVID next year and connecting um, our, our site decisions and policies to our mission and vision. Thank you, Mary. Any questions from our governing board? All right, we will move over to AVID in Action and celebrating AVID at Page Middle School. And I'll turn the time over to our building principal, Elisa Covington, who is going to celebrate our work at Page Middle School, as well as talk about systems. Yate. Good evening, Governing Board President, Governing Board members, Mr. Wallen and Cabinet. So I was um, assigned to speak to you all about systems and how that's reflected in our district as well as at Page Middle School. So with systems, AVID is a school-wide, is school-wide when systems are in place that support governance, governance, curriculum and instruction, data collection and analysis, professional learning and student and parent outreach to ensure college readiness for AVID elective students and improved academic performance for all students. Effective governance includes evidence of college readiness and an aligned mission and vision statement of the school, which you've just heard some evidences of for our district. AVID representation and decision-making, most of our AVID site teams are also our site leadership teams or representatives um, are comprised of some of the same members. The site leadership team that includes members who fit the following roles. So AVID site coordinator, AVID elective teacher, AVID counselor, general education teachers, and special populations are um, represented as an option for ELL students, special education students, and students who have been um, labeled as being economically disadvantaged. Our master schedule also that is developed collabor collaboratively with members of the SLT or site leadership team through the lens of the aligned AVID and school mission and vision. For management of the uh, AVID elective at Page Middle School, um, the AVID elective is teacher and student led, making sure that the student, it is student centered and not teacher centered. On Mondays, usually there is a skill-based lesson. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, there's tutoring with collaborative study groups. Wednesdays, an application-based lesson. And on Fridays, they consider it a fun Friday, it's community building. Effective data systems re is reflected by a system of analysis that includes data being used intentionally by staff to rack um, and reach academic student outcomes and monitor student support structures over time. You will see evidences of this at each campus through the protocols that we use for data analysis, for lesson plan, unit reviews, and lesson reviews. There is an analysis of CFAs, which are our weekly assessments that we give throughout the district our STAR data that we have at the elementary levels or STAR assessments and NWEA map assessments you see at the secondary. An effective system for professional learning is evidenced by processes put in place by which the implementation and professional learning is monitored, coached, and adjust, adjusted to ensure that PD is embedded in daily routines and that release days for peer observations and mentoring are available. So thank you governing board for making sure that we continue to have an early release day. Our professional development for teachers is not only facilitated on these early 
days uh, or early out days for students, but our committed learning days for the adults in our learning communities. Um, but it is facilitated through our SATs and also site leaders on those days, in addition to having the afternoon and PM observations um, and times for teachers across the district to, to be a part of AVID lessons. Our summer training is also included in that professional development. There is AVID weekly and bi-weekly training that is available um, in addition to the mid-year training. A system of effective curriculum instruction and student support is evidenced by enrollment of subgroups as a part of the AVID classes. And once again, our subgroups are referred to our students that are ELLs, special education um, students and economically disadvantaged students. And seeing them represented in the rigorous classroom. So at the high school, there would be like the AP or the honors classes, at the middle school would be honors classes. Um, and making sure that, that the groups that are reflected in those higher classes, those rigorous classes are reflective of the school's demographics. The master schedule also being in alignment with AVID is another evidence, ensuring that there are multiple sections of rigorous classes and that all students have equal access to be a part of those classes. Instructional observations and coaching, which includes not only leadership being able to observe teachers, but teachers having opportunities to um, peer observe. Effective use of student-based technologies as demonstrated by students and by teachers. Um, vertical and horizontal articulation and ongoing discussions that occur to determine the effectiveness of vertical articulation. When it comes to assessments of student progress, there are walkthroughs. You may have, hear teachers and leaders talk about wicker walkthroughs or at the lower elementary level, they're called L wicker walks. And that means that the students are learning um, the wicker. They're learning about writing. They're learning about um, inquiry. They're learning about collaboration, organization and reading to learn. It also includes our different assessments and our assessments across the district. Oftentimes we forget um, our, prime, our preschool, even though it's not uh, an AVID certified, they also do assessments for their students to monitor their growth. And they use systems and assessments such as Teaching Strategies Bold and the Eckers rating scale. We want to thank you, governing board members, for your continued support of the following that you've put in, helped us to put in place to support the effectiveness of these systems I just mentioned. Flexible master schedules that reflect the needs of the learners and propel teaching and learning at a higher cognitive level to include common planning times. The practice of the use of common planning time for PLCs focused on data analysis, action, and lesson planning for effective and powerful tier one implementation and facilitation of learning the first time around. The construction and use of pacing guides, which you have allowed us to be supported through beyond textbooks with that implementation. Academic support structures such as funding, appropriate staffing and supports to help develop our community of learners holistically, cognitively, academically, socially, emotionally, as well as physically. Data talks and discussions that tie the data to the future lesson implementation and refinement. Um, honoring our site leaders' commitments to be in classrooms to observe and support teacher observations. Implementing effective observation and evaluation in instruments, which include the CCI that Shannon talked about earlier this evening. And supporting our Wednesday early release for PD, PLC, and vertical articulation opportunities. There is a slide and you will see the names of the, the site members, AVID site team, who happen to also be our site leadership team at Page Middle School. These actually is, this is a list that consists of four runners of equitable learning opportunities being implemented on our site. But this is just a small representation as I believe my uh, other colleagues, the leaders at the other sites would say also, it's a small representation of the great work that our individual teams are doing and have done to bring rigor, relevance and cultural, social, emotional awareness and relevance needed to move our students up and onwards. So many hours, some unpaid, have been put into, um, into this work of moving our schools to ensure that our students are continuing to grow. And for that, we are grateful. Thank you.
Thank you, Elisa. Any questions from our governing board? I have a question. Um, you said there were some unpaid hours. What does that mean? We have, um, because of our budget cuts, um, usually our site team leaders are paid a stipend that goes throughout the year and they were paid a stipend. It's just that as a smaller the amount than they would usually get. So they were able to, we, we were able to make sure that they had um, a stipend for first semester, but not for a second semester. Okay, thank you. Hi, this is Charles Weiss. And so I just had a question regarding the AVID program at Page Middle School and how do you feel that's um, the impact it's had for the Page Middle School and the progression? Well, one of the things that we can definitely say um, is that AVID, AVID, AVID platform and AVID program and the philosophy behind AVID of college and career readiness is definitely um, a mover and shaker to get teachers, their mindsets um, shifted and believing that all students can learn and that all students should be prepared um, and our, our, our teaching should prepare students to have a choice. Um, that's really the focus of, of AVID is that we're preparing students to have a choice of whether they will choose the track to college um, or choose the track to a career or do both. Um, what had happened, you know, when we talk about in, in, inequities, there have been historically inequities that only, um, through which teachers only focused on these certain students are only available for this track these certain students were only available for this track. So to answer your question, um, building in the mentality that you can make it, um, that you can be college bound um, has been um, something I think has been very important on our campus. Uh, we have a, with the AVID elective, the only struggle is with the AVID school-wide, there are those implementations that you see in every classroom, and that's as far as the wicker. Our goal or our focus for this year at Page Middle School has been with the reading, um, with the reading and the, the writing and inquiry part. Uh, those are the three that we really focused on. Those are what we implement school-wide. The AVID elective, every student doesn't have an opportunity to be a part of the AVID elective. And it's not because uh, the choice isn't put there, but to be in an AVID elective class, you have to select it. Um, it is not something that's, that's forced. Um, for sixth grade, if, if we had more time for sixth grade, we could do almost like the model that you see at elementary where it's AVID for all. And so those things that the students in the AVID elective get go a little bit deeper as far as the strategies and skills um, and that you need to um, acquire to be able to become a lifelong learner. And because students have to opt in, um, that's where the struggle is as far as being able to really implement it at a deeper level than we, than we are currently. Thank you, Elisa. Did that answer your question, Mr. Weiss? Yeah, yes, thank you. Okay. All right, now let's move into AVID in Action and celebrating AVID at Page High School. Joined now by Principal Ann Martin she is going to share celebrations as well as talk about the domain of instruction. Good evening, board members. So I have been assigned instruction and the way that I uh, can help maybe make sense of the talk of an AVID elective versus the AVID system, which is the four domains, is to think of the AVID elective as a piece within the entire system. So the things that I'll share with you about uh, the instructional domain, as Ms. Covington said, they go deeper and are reinforced at a different level, uh, as well as other things within that AVID elective class. So the domain of instruction promotes wicker strategies, 21st century skills, 
student leadership skills, goal setting or monitoring, and as we've already stated, rigor for all. Uh, this domain is part of the larger system, which is used to promote AVID school-wide for all students. At Page High School, these are promoted uh, not only in the content classes, uh, but is also through advisory period and our AVID elective class. We do have uh, a AVID elective class per grade level. So we have one AVID 9, one AVID 10, 11, and 12. And the AVID class uh, as an elective is a program within the AVID school-wide system. And it provides targeted support to students who are first-generation college goers. As Ms. Covington says, they opt in or they elect to go through the process to be selected as an AVID elective student. In the AVID elective, academic supports are provided specifically for college readiness and by an AVID trained teacher. So um, I think it was Ms. Mrs. Warner mentioned PD that goes on, professional development. Um, there's a whole nother level of professional development for an AVID elective teacher. Uh, the school-wide instruction uh, is really anchored in what you've heard over and over, the acronym that we call WICKER. Um, so WICKER provides a learning model that educators use to guide students in comprehending concepts and articulating ideas at increasingly complex levels. You may have heard this called scaffolding. And this is really the aim of not only meeting the academic supports of the AVID elective student, but also improving academic performance for all students. So I just wanna give a, a shout out to our PHS site team, which uh, like the middle school, this is also our school leadership team. I have listed there for you our um, AVID elective teachers as well as our other members of the site team. And they really um, not only are uh, they're, they meeting their primary roles as a classroom teacher or student achievement teacher or counselor or CTE director, uh, but they also serve various leadership roles around our campus. And in doing that, they make AVID instructional practices a focus of the teams they lead, the professional development they offer to our staff, and the coaching conversations they have. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Anne. Any questions from our governing board? I do have a question. This is Dee. Um, usually when you're incorporating a new program, much of it is really based on some prior knowledge so with this new AVID, which is open across the school system, I'd be most interested in many of our students that had gone through the AVID training that are now in college or were they ready for careers. Any information in regards to that, Anne? What I'm asking is, to do a study on our former graduates that are going to higher education or career readiness. How are they doing? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Dee. Yeah, usually um, I raised this question several years ago in regards to getting feedback from our graduates on how ready they were at higher education or in careers that they selected. And they said it's really hard to get that information. What has it been with you, Anne, since this is what your second year? Yeah, I, I don't have that information for you. That's not something that's tracked through the CCI, which is the coaching and certification instrument. Um, it, it is something that uh, the CCI tracks what we're currently doing. We haven't done any longitudinal uh, data digs on the students that have 
have graduated and were part of the AVID elective, the program part of the, of the school-wide system. Can I add some clarifying information or something that may, may assist Misty? And yeah. I'm, I'm not at the, the high school. This is Ms. Covington. Um, okay. Uh, being a part of a, a district who used AVID before, the, the tracking is the very, um, you have to have a lot of connections outside of the district in order to do the tracking. The tracking is very important though, because it does speak to the effectiveness of the skill building within that AVID elective and, um, and whether or not the students who went through the process were AVID, AVID uh, lifelong learners. Um, but the tracking that we had to do in one of my former districts is actually having connections with the, the local colleges and then whatever the closest or the nearest four-year college was or, or, or that were surrounding. The other thing that we had to do was really, uh, there was a cons really a consortium of people that we had that were not, that were no longer in the school system who had to make connections with the students. And then um, they had monthly calls that they had to make with the students keeping track of how they were doing. Um, and so this was a two year process and you have to have that group of people committed to the particular work. One of the things that helped to, us to keep track of, of some of the, the students and their progress was a particular grant, grant that came out of our local uh, college. And at that time, the college was looking at implementing the AVID, uh, AVID college program there. And so, of course, you know, as you will with anything that you're implementing in, and in any area where people have choice, um, you'll find that not everyone went the full track. Some did two years, some did the four years, some went the, the career um, option, which is, is highly encouraged as well, because even with career, you have to get the, the technical training. Um, so, so there's a, a variance that you saw, but really in order to do that, it takes a lot of, of groundwork and it also takes that another level of relationship, not just building, but sustaining as you continue with students after they have graduated, because that's the thing. Once they, they graduate, it's, you have to be able to, to find out where they are and how they're doing. Thank you for those, you know, comments. I guess we have some information to do a comparative study between the middle school and the high school. Since our little eighth graders left last year, there are now freshmen. Maybe this might be kind of like a, a beginning on how effective it is and once they do leave. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa and Anne. A quick video to further look at the impact on avid people like me. People like me. People like me. People like me. People like me don't go to college. Nobody's ever gonna convince me that I'm gonna be somebody someday. Street cred. It's more valuable to me than my education. My life will be defined by those who doubt me. I know there are some out there looking up to me. I'll let those AP and honor students be future leaders and policy makers. Because me, I'm just one out of a long line of statistics. Who knows, maybe I'll even study. But it won't affect how my life is gonna turn out. People tell me I can't succeed because they can't see past my skin color or how I talk. They say I don't care enough to be a first-generation college student. I am the last person in my family that's going to be successful. I'm aware of the skills and talents I possess. This is my destiny. That was me before Albert helped me see my potential, believe in myself, and turn all of that around. And now, this is my destiny. I am aware of the skills and talents I possess to be successful. I am the last person in my family that's ever going to be a first-generation college student. I don't care enough, they say, 
It's because they can't see past my skin color, how I talk. People tell me I can't succeed, but it won't affect how my life is going to turn out. Who knows? Maybe I'll even study statistics. Because me, I'm just one out of a long line of future leaders and policy makers. I'll let those AP and honor students be looking up to me. <laughs> I know there are some out there, those who doubt me. My life will be defined by my education. It's more valuable to me than street cred. I'm going to be somebody someday. Nobody's ever going to convince me that people like me don't go to college. In closing, the goal of this evening's presentation was to continue to build our governing board's background in AVID. We received an update on where we've been, where we're currently at, and where we're growing to with AVID. I want to say thank you again to our building principals for joining me this evening to share AVID in Action celebrations, as well as highlight the four domains. As we continue to move forward in our work, we need governing board support in everything that we do. Thank you again for this opportunity to present this evening. I look forward to future oppor opportunities to update our governing board. And these opportunities may include um, students presenting and sharing their AVID story. Dee was asking about the impact that it has on our individual students during their educational experience here, as well as post-secondary. It is incredibly powerful to hear from our individual students about their AVID journey. We are living our work currently with our CCI, the coaching and certification instrument. Teams will complete the CCI and submit that data to me on by April 30th. And a future work study session may provide for an opportunity for us to share growth and progress and certification updates for each of our schools. We will continue to grow professional learning within our district around AVID. We are striving to build capacity among all of our teachers to meet the unique learning needs of all of our students through AVID. With all programs and systems in our district, we will continue to evaluate the impact and effectiveness. This process should be ongoing and continuous to ensure that we are providing the greatest educational experience for our learners and truly preparing them for college, career, and life. Thank you again, Governing Board, for this opportunity this evening. Thank you again to my colleagues, our building principals, for joining us. What additional questions can we answer for our Governing Board at this time? Uh, Shannon, I'd just like to say a couple things. i um, really impressed. Thank you, all of you, for that presentation. That uh, was really well done and encouraging, top to bottom. And I'll never, when we first heard the word AVID, um, I think it's taken me all t t today to remember what AVID means. So, but, so thanks for that. <laughs> but uh, I remember having a presentation in the board boardroom. Uh, I think some of the first AVID st students that were going to be graduating. And it was really, really impressive, first of all, just how they were able to articulate what they have been through. And I, I remember approaching one of the young ladies that was in the boardroom while I was wandering the high school and she was about four foot nine and this was kind of towards the end of the year and I stopped and talked to her and she had a, a notebook. <laughs> uh, I would have needed a wheelbarrow to carry that thing around but she was carrying it on her hip and I said, so what's that? She, she, and I said, can you tell me what ha how you've been doing? and uh, how you've been doing from quarter to quarter. And she opened that notebook and she had tests, notes and everything else, month to month, day to day. And uh, that was just super impressive. But what was more impressive tonight uh, was really the, the language that was being spoken from K through 12. And uh, everybody's speaking the same language and developing that culture. And really that's a real key in moving forward. And so uh, Mrs. D, I really appreciate your question. The follow-up is gonna be really good for the kids that leave here. But at this point, I'm like a, 
high school baseball coach, uh, we need to get to a we need to get to a place academically, and so I'm more concerned about the little leagues, <laughs> the what the what the preschoolers are doing, what the kindergartners are doing, first through second, because that's the most important time of their life to get that educational start. And I'm really uh, glad to hear what's going on, Nancy, Mary, and uh, Penny. But uh, thank you guys so much. I think we're on a good track. I'm how about we get in an echo here anyway, but uh, I hope you understand. I really appreciate where we're going with this. And uh, that'll be the real measure. What are we seeing going to the middle school? What are we seeing going to the high school? And uh, ultimately, once you get that s systematic approach, uh, I really think that's going to be real important for our, our kids and uh, would appreciate everything you guys do. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you, President Candelaria. Can I just mention something? I appreciate the presentation that was given tonight. I think a few years back that um, we attended an ASVA conference. Um, AVID had a table at the conference and one of the in some of the presentations that they had available to board members, I thought this was one that stuck at, stood out to us. And at the time we approached um, Superintendent um, Barner and asked, why are we not teaching AVID in elementary, meaning primary and um, Desert View, Lakeview and Desert View? Because I think it is very important just kind of mentioning what Bob had to say is bridging our avid learners starting at kindergarten. And you mentioned that it actually starts with preschool. So that's very important to hear and understand. And also I know in years past, we've only had middle and high school, but this is nice that we're including the younger grades and having them have a head start and hopefully that our kindergartners from last year who are currently first graders complete um, the AVID program throughout their high school year and continue into their career or high um, college preparation. So thank you for the presentation. I look forward to hearing more, um, I guess, the update. I would like a copy of each of the domain that was mentioned. And that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Desiree, and thank you for your advocacy to make AVID district-wide within our school district and get it for all of our learners, kindergarten through 12th grade. Oh, yes, good evening, this is Charles Weiss. Um, thank you for the presentation too, it was very um, informative. Um, also, I'd let, just like to comment, you know, that uh, I don't think the transition has been very great with uh, elementary to middle school and then the same from middle school to high school. And so I hope that this will help, especially in the elementary level, that transition to middle school. And that's all I had to say. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Charles. Okay, anybody else? Are we good? Yeah, I'd like to just comment yeah, sure. on in regards to what's next, I think they listed four or five bullets. I like the idea of students coming forth and sharing their experiences probably like in the spring. Thank yes. you very much. We used to have this that presentation uh, during the May board meeting each year. Um, we haven't had it for several years, but the students would come in and they would tell the board um, what they learned through the program, where they were going to school, uh, just kind of give them some insight on their their future plans. Thank you, Dee, and thank you, Lynn. Yes, it is incredibly powerful, as I shared before, to hear from our individual students about their AVID journey. Matter of fact, we bring in AVID students into new, new teacher induction to have them be introduced to AVID by hearing specifically from our students and their experience. So we look forward to a future opportunity with the governing board to bring that back. Thank you. Very good, any further comments? Well, the one I would like to add is in the presentation, there's a, one of the young men, uh, boys that was on there said, uh, before AVID basically, 
my life will be defined by those that doubt me. He went through Avid, and then he came back as they were talking about what Avid did for them, and he said, my life will be defined by my education. I think that is so powerful. If we can do that for every kid, oh, wow, we will, we will be doing some great work. Thank you. I agree. Thank you, Superintendent Wallen. Okay. I think we may be done. And Shannon, appreciate that very much. Principals, thank you so much. And uh, how you took each one of those pieces. That was re really good. So thanks for that uh, update and encouragement. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on to item number C, review of board corner newsletter. And uh, Chuck Weiss was really kind to volunteer for this uh, effort. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so, Chuck, it's yours. You've got a couple minutes to go ahead and just tell us what you're up to with this. Um, so I didn't know if there was a copy of it or we, I, I didn't bring one with me. Oh, okay. Well, just uh, normally we do just, I thought we'd have a copy here too. So um, it is uploaded in the board doc. Oh, okay. Okay. So we could take a look at it, yeah. but just give us kind of a sense where you're going with it. So... Uh, basically, um, you know, just going off of the uh, previous uh, um, newsletters and um, our current our situation the past year, you know, I just kind of highlighted uh, what we've gone through at the school and what's um, impacted students, families, you know, in uh, our communities across the country and and um, but also realize, you know, that even though we've gone through these tough times, we, you know, we uh, have to be positive and optimistic for our future and especially for our children and, you know, to continue on with education and how important it is to um, continue that education process and in a safe, you know, a safe manner in a safe way mm -hmm. so that, um, you know, we still have the ability to um, promote students, uh, you know, in a successful path. So that's basically, you know, in short, what I was trying to get in my uh, my letter. All right, I look forward to it. And I, I, I did you did you hold on to your title? Hold tight. Was it hold tight or hold on or what? <laughs> hold fast. <laughs> hold fast. Yeah, yeah, that's a hold fast. And what does hold fast mean? That's uh, one of the uh, terminologies we used in the Navy, you know, as far as holding on and, um, you know, weathering out the storm, so to speak, and, yep. you know, enduring through the tough times and getting through it, basically. Well, appreciate that. Looking forward to that. And that's going to be the next uh, newsletter, I guess, coming out with, with color picture. And uh, you'll be... I understand you're going to be, uh, are you going to be in the high school signing autographs? Or I just want to know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. No, appreciate you. Thank you so much. And we'll look forward to that. Mm -hmm. uh, item D, future board meetings. And uh, this is to just, uh, as I understand, Lynn, I'm, I think I'm. Uh, we're going to try to, talk about what we want to see in future board meetings, work study sessions? No, this was just for the purpose of you to discuss, uh, do you want to continue on doing Zoom meetings? Do you, do you? Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, I, I think, well, at board members, what do you think? Because at this point we, uh, you know, we're, most of us are in here at this point, but I, what's your thought process about moving forward? Open or leave it optional? I would like to keep it optional between virtual and also remote. The reason why I say that is because um, my schedule is kind of wonky everywhere, <laughs> but yep. it's, it's just easier to either, you know, just do Zoom meetings. So yeah, being here, or remotely. 
Okay. It's helpful for for my behalf. And plus, um, I think most times I will be here just only because my internet is not the best at home. Okay. Keep it as is, board? Yes, I would keep it as is. Okay. Sandra, any any comment? Chuck? Okay, you just said thumbs up, keep it as it is. And I guess uh, uh, we'll just do that, give people the option. I know we're, we call around and we set these things up early. And, uh, but uh, Lynn, I guess we have our answer. We'll just keep it as it is uh, until further notice. Uh, okay. things are, things are changing real, real quickly. And so we're excited about that. But at the same time, we, we do want to be real mindful uh, of, of personal situations and still in the midst of this. So sound good. Yep. All right. I will ask for a motion to adjourn in a second. I mean, make a motion to adjourn. Thank you. I second that motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, board members and guests, and I really appreciate the presentations tonight, and Superintendent Wallen, and of course, Lynn, thank you so much for all you do, and Brian, you are the, you're like the guy in the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, so thank you for, for getting all this done. Thank you. We are adjourned at, uh, I think,